This evening, we're looking at um, our topic from one particular passage of Matthew chapter 5 uh, in verses 17 through 20. And again, you can look it up in your Bibles or you'll see it projected behind me, but this is, oddly enough, one of the passages that those who believe that we don't need to keep the law or the law has passed away will come to, to prove it, and it's also the passage that, that we would come to to prove that it actually does continue. So that, that is interesting, isn't it? But uh, not unusual, considering how sin does affect our minds. We shouldn't be surprised that people coming to it would come away with two opposite conclusions. Not the only place in the Bible where that occurs, but it, it is, um, this is one of those places. So let's go ahead and read that in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Jesus says this in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing again this evening. Now, as already mentioned, our passage this evening comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus here is speaking to his disciples, and not only to his disciples, but all the Jews who had gathered to hear him. Now, what he's addressing in this particular section is perhaps one of the main questions the Jews had of the Messiah's ministry. What did Jesus actually come to do? especially with regard to the law and the prophets. Now remember what the law and the prophets are. It's referring to the entire Old Testament, the Old Testament scriptures. Has Jesus come to do away with these things? Has he come to abolish these things? Was he coming to change the standard of righteousness and basically to put something new in its place? Well, interestingly, and Contrary to what many people believe, the answer to that question really is no. Jesus says emphatically he hasn't come to abolish it. He has come rather to fulfill it. He says everything in it is, everything written is going to stand until heaven and earth pass away. Not the smallest letter or stroke is going to pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Now I think here's one of the issues that comes up until everything has come to pass everything that is in the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus has come to fulfill the righteousness of it, but everything that is written in it must come to pass. And so Jesus goes on to say that those who then keep these commandments, even the least of them, uh, and teaches all of these commandments in his kingdom. Now, it's not talking about you know, just that present state before his death and so forth, but in his kingdom, that's, that's where we are now. The kingdom that he was bringing is the kingdom that we are a part of now. The one who in this kingdom keeps and teaches these commandments, he shall be called great. But those who don't keep them, he says, even the very least of them, and teaches others to do the same, will be called least. Now we know that Jesus goes on from here to correct all the misunderstandings that had accrued by the teachings of the, the Pharisees because they had changed the meaning of the law to make it accommodate their lifestyle. Jesus goes on to lift the law back up to its original standard, to its original state of purity. And then he concludes with this rather sobering statement in our text. He says, if your life doesn't demonstrate any more of a commitment to the Lord, and to his holiness than that of the scribes and Pharisees, he says, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven at all. And what he means by that, of course, is you will not enter into heaven. If your life does not reflect holiness, pursue peace with all men, the author to the Hebrews says, 
and that righteousness without which no one will see God. Now from this passage, I want us to consider three things this evening, and it's a rather large topic, but I don't think it's going to take a great deal of time to see it. Three things. Why many churches today believe the Ten Commandments are no longer the standard for the believer. We don't have to keep them. Secondly, why we believe, on the contrary, that the Bible teaches that they are still the standard and we do need to keep them. And then finally, what difference does it make what we believe concerning this? As long as we believe the gospel, isn't that enough? Well, we're going to see that it isn't enough. It is in a certain sense, but it isn't in another sense. So first of all, let's consider why many churches today believe the Ten Commandments no longer are the standard for the believer. Now, certainly there are many arguments that are used against the commandments. Some of them are very specific. Some of them are very broad and sweeping arguments. So let's look at one of the sweeping arguments, that used by the dispensationalists. Now, I'm always using the dispensationalists as my foil, it seems. <laughs> but that's because um, not only did I come from a dispensational background, not only did I, uh, you know, uh, was I educated in a dispensational college, but the vast majority of churches today, of evangelical Christians, are dispensational. And so this is what a majority of believers will believe today. Now they believe that the present age, the church age, is basically God's plan B. Now plan A is for the Jews. Uh, plan B came in when the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and he turned uh, to the Gentiles. Now basically they believe that this is a mystery, something that was really either not mentioned or explained in the Old Testament. It was a mystery. It's kind of a mystery to me why they thought that, but that's what we were instructed in college. But it's a mystery. It's something that wasn't explained, something not foretold, something that God just sort of broke into history when the unthinkable took place when the Jews rejected the Messiah. God basically put his plan for Israel on hold he opened up this envelope of time, which is called the church age, in which he is reaching out to the Gentiles with the gospel, although he's certainly not neglecting uh, the Jews. And we know that once they're done, or once the Lord is done with, with the church age, with his gathering in these Gentiles, he's going to rapture the church out of the world. This is what dispensationalism believes. And then he's going to turn back to the Jew, and he's going to bring in the 70th week of Daniel, as we saw on other occasions seven-year tribulation period and after that there's going to be the second coming the bringing in of the millennium and after the millennium of course the resurrection of the unjust and that final judgment for them and and then the eternal state now we've already seen why we don't believe that scenario I don't have time to explain that why tonight but you can look at some of the previous sermons we've done on that subject but they believe that when God put his plan on hold uh, for the Jews and he introduced this entirely new program that involves the Jews, but it's primarily for the Gentiles, that the Lord also introduced a new standard. Now, one thing we should be thankful for is that the standard that they believe that God has introduced is very similar to the Ten Commandments. That, that, that's actually good, but it's not exactly the Ten Commandments. When everything is said and done, they basically end up with a standard that includes nine of the Ten Commandments, but leaves the Fourth Commandment out. And we'll look at that when we get to the Fourth Commandment. They do say, however, as one of my professors in college was uh, often saying, that the commandments that we're keeping, even these nine which are like the nine of the Ten Commandments, are not from the Ten Commandments, because we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments any longer. The illustration that he used was, let's say you're a United States citizen and you go down into Mexico. When you're in Mexico, you're no longer under American law or the law of the United States. Now you're under the law of Mexico because you're down in Mexico and you're going to be held accountable to that. The same way as we have moved from the old covenant to the new covenant, we're no longer under the law for the old covenant. There's been a sharp break. That's for the Jews. This is for the church, and so the Lord gives a new standard for the church. Now, again, as we look at that, we might say, well, they haven't really you know, strayed that far. They haven't gone that far wrong. 
because they at least have nine of the ten, as I mentioned before. But sadly, we also know that within those circles, even though they would hold to nine tenths, we might say, of the law, they do not believe that you need to keep them in order to be a Christian. And that isn't universal in dispensationalism, but I would say it's probably a majority of dispensationalists seem to believe that. Now, John MacArthur is a dispensationalist. He doesn't believe that. He believes you have to obey. That's good. But there was a huge movement and a controversy that brewed well, several years ago now when I was in college uh, when John MacArthur wrote the book, The Gospel According to Jesus. And what he you know, wrote in that book was that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you also have to submit to him as your Lord. And if you don't do that, he's not your Savior either. Well, there was this huge outcry from, it seemed like, every quarter, and everyone on campus was up in arms against John MacArthur. He's added works to salvation. You don't have to keep the law. All you have to do is simply trust in Jesus. So again, here's that anti-lordship uh, element that is introduced into this. Even though they see nine of the 10 continuing, the nine of the 10 commandments are still basically irrelevant. You can be a Christian and not obey them. Now, if you want to be a disciple, you have to obey them. If you want to be a Christian, you don't have to. If you want to be a Christian, just say the prayer. You're a Christian. And you're locked in. You're not, never going to be lost. But if you want to get serious, then become a disciple. And if you become a disciple, you have to obey. If you break the commandments, then you have to repent. But not if you're just going to be an ordinary Christian. Again, it, hopefully that doesn't sound good to you. It isn't good. It isn't right. But they do believe that if you say you have to keep the commandments in order to enter into heaven in any sense, that you have added works to the gospel, you have destroyed the gospel, you're a legalist, and you're not going to enter into heaven. Now, again, these believe that you can live any way you want to live and still make it into heaven. But the Bible tells us that that could not be any further from the truth. The Bible says you have to keep the commandments in order to enter into heaven. Now, I realize that sounds like a very, uh, well, it sounds like a legalistic statement, so I am going to explain that a little later on, but you cannot be a disobedient Christian. You cannot practice sin. You're not going to enter into heaven. Now, that's the sweeping argument. That was for the Jews. God's put his plan for the Jews on hold. He's turned to the church. There's a new standard for the church, and even that's optional. It's grace, 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 not law, 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 okay. But there are perhaps a couple of specific arguments to prove the law is no longer relevant. Some point to Galatians 3.10. I don't know how many times we've had people visiting from other churches who point me to this passage and say, how can you say we have to obey the law in light of this passage? Okay, Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Well, there you go. You see, if you keep the law, you're under a curse. If you want to keep them, you'll have to keep them perfectly or you're going to end up being destroyed. Now, some even point to our passage, the one I've looked at, um, or the one that we've read for our, our uh, passage, our text this evening, and they believe that Jesus couldn't have said it any more clearly than he did, that the law only stood until it was fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. But once he fulfilled it, it's passed away along with the old covenant. So again, the net result is the commandments no longer apply. Now again, that's the reason why there are churches that believe we no longer have to keep the commandments. They're no longer relevant. They're no longer the standard. But over against this, why do we believe that the Ten Commandments still are the standard and that we need to obey them. Well, first of all, because we do not believe the Bible teaches that the church age is God's plan B, but rather is the fulfillment, the fulfillment of everything that God promised in his covenants to the Jews. I think we already saw this morning that when the Jews rejected Jesus Christ and crucified him, they didn't put God's plan on hold, but rather they fulfilled God's plan. This is what God wanted to happen. 
Peter, speaking to the Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.23, says, This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Now notice that what they did was God's plan. God uh, knew that this is what they were going to do. This is what God wanted to take place in order to save his people. It wasn't something that put God's plan for the Jews on hold. It's something that brought about the fulfillment of his plan for the Jews. By the way, I do want to mention in that light that we saw this morning, God did not force them to do this. He didn't inject them with evil so that they would crucify Jesus Christ. He simply used their own evil. He let them make their own choice of their own free will. They crucified Jesus Christ. You know what? When Peter preached that on the day of Pentecost, the Jews didn't say, well, if, if this was God's plan, we must not have had any choice. So it's not our fault. That's not what they said. What they said was, men and brethren, what shall we do? We've, we've crucified our Messiah. And Peter says to them, repent. Okay? God meant it for good, but they meant it for evil. They were still responsible for what they did because they chose to crucify him. So again, the point is that this was the fulfillment of what God intended. The new covenant is the fulfillment of all those covenants that God made with Israel. It is not plan B. I remember when I was in college and I was wrestling through these issues, and again, the college that I went to was a dispensational college. I looked at this one text of scripture in the book of Romans where Paul uh, was basically saying, that uh, what Israel was seeking after, some of those people actually received it, and some of them didn't. He says in Romans 11:7, what then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it. Okay, now again, think, think about from a dispensational mindset, the idea that uh, the Jews reject their Messiah, their plan is put on hold, so whatever God had intended for them is, is put off until way in the future when he's done with the church. But this text says what Israel is seeking for it didn't obtain, but those who were chosen obtained it. So I asked the question, what is it that they obtained? What is it that Israel was seeking after? But wasn't it the blessings of the new covenant that God had promised? And doesn't Paul say that there were those who actually obtained it? Uh, he's, he's not saying that this is plan B, but he's saying this is fulfillment. There are those who actually received what it is that God had promised. He's not setting aside what the Jews were promised. He's actually giving it to those who received the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the fulfillment of those covenants. Now, just to be accurate so that we don't mis, uh, misinterpret or misrepresent the dispensationalists. Again, I want to get too technical here, but they do make a distinction between the new covenant and the church age. They do believe that the new covenant is only for the Jews. And because the Jews rejected the Messiah, um, basically the new covenant isn't going to come until the Lord is finished with the church, raptures the church, turns again to Israel, deals with them for those seven years. Those Jews that repent will actually receive the new covenant. Those who don't, of course, will be destroyed. But we don't believe that. We believe this isn't plan B, it's fulfillment. This is the new covenant, okay? They believe the new covenant is future. They think the church age is a mystery. We believe the church age is the new covenant. It is the fulfillment of all of God's blessings. So again, that is my point. The church age is the new covenant. It's not plan B. And so the Lord did not start something entirely new. But he's continuing something that he started a long time ago. Therefore, the Lord didn't set aside his, his standard of righteousness because of something new, but rather he is bringing it into the fulfillment of all these covenants. Basically, Jesus says as much in our passage, he didn't come to abolish what God had done before. He didn't come to set aside the law and the prophets. Rather, he came to fulfill them. 
Now that's an answer to the dispensational objection. This isn't plan B, this is fulfillment. So God hasn't set aside what he intended previously. Now what about what Paul says in Romans, or excuse me, Galatians 3.10, if you're of the works of the law, you're under a curse. Well, he's not talking there about uh, obedience uh, that comes about through salvation. Uh, he's not talking about what we call evangelical obedience, about how, you know, if, if you are saved by the Lord and He changes your heart, that you will want to keep the commandments to show your love and your thankfulness. That's not what Paul's addressing here. He's basically talking about those who would try to justify themselves by keeping the law. Now, again, remember, this is in the book of Galatians, and Paul is addressing the Galatian error, which is the Judaizers coming and telling them that if you're going to be saved, you must be circumcised, you must keep the law of Moses, otherwise you're going to be lost. Now, Paul says if you receive circumcision on that basis, receive circumcision to save yourself, if you obey the law of Moses to save yourself, then you have fallen from grace. You've, you've basically been severed from Christ. You're no longer uh, you know, trusting Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Now you're looking to your own righteousness based upon your own obedience. That is what Paul is condemning in this passage. Those who are of the works of the law are under a curse. Those who are trying to save themselves through their obedience they are under the curse of the law of, or the covenant of works. Basically, they're still under the broken covenant of works. They're going to end up being condemned. You cannot save yourself by law keeping. And if you try to do that apart from Christ, you're going to perish because all you can do is sin. You need Jesus Christ. Now, what about what Jesus says in our passage? I mean, hasn't he fulfilled the law of God, and doesn't that make it irrelevant for us today? Well, you need to realize that Jesus is, is saying in no uncertain terms that that is exactly what he doesn't mean here. He, didn't, he says he didn't come to abolish the law of God. That's not why he came. He says everything in it will stand as long as heaven and earth stand until everything that is written in it is accomplished, or basically until it has all come to pass. If you think, he says, if you think that even the least commandment has passed away and you live as though it has and you teach others as though it has, Jesus says you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Does it sound to you like he's saying the law has passed away? But if you keep them and you teach them, all of them, he says you will be called great. And again, Jesus goes on to talk about the commandments in the, the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, but I say to you, and he lifts the commandments back up to their, their pristine state, to their purity, uh, removing all the errors that the, the Pharisees and the scribes had attached to them. And don't forget, at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus sends his disciples into the world to make disciples and to teach them everything that he had commanded them to do. Now, Jesus here is, is basically, he's telling them they need to observe the commandments. And so he says, teach the disciples you make to do the same thing. You need to keep the commandments. Now, it doesn't sound to me as though Jesus was teaching the end of the commandments, but rather he's teaching their continuance. And by the way, we need to see that Jesus is not teaching just the continuance. Well, in a certain sense, he is. In a certain sense, he isn't. Of only the Ten Commandments, that's not what he really has in mind here, but he's talking about the law and the prophets. These, the Old Testament scriptures they actually contain quite a bit. He says everything in the law and the prophets, every commandment, even the least of them, continue in some sense. Now, I ask myself the question because, you know, well, especially when I was in dispensational circles, uh, you can't avoid the fact when you look in the New Testament, you're reading. You see all these quotations from the Old Testament. You see the apostles quoting the Old Testament with absolute authority and applying it to the church. And you ask yourself the question, if the Old Testament is irrelevant, as, as dispensationalism believes, then why are the apostles quoting it with authority? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Could it be? Because the law and the prophets are still relevant, as our Lord Jesus is telling us here. Could this be why Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture 
is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine or for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When Paul wrote that, what was he talking about? He was talking about the law and the prophets. He was talking about the Old Testament scriptures because when he wrote that to Timothy, a great deal of the New Testament had not yet been written, though I believe he included what was written at that point. But certainly not exclusively. All scripture is inspired by God and it is profitable. So Jesus here is teaching the relevance of the law and the prophets. Now, does that mean that Jesus is saying that really nothing has changed from the old covenants and nothing has changed from the law and the prophets, that everything comes in? This is one of the biggest questions that we have to face uh, in the New Testament church. Now, I don't think that Jesus is saying nothing has changed because Jesus certainly has uh, fulfilled certain things and certain things have changed. For instance, we don't bring animal sacrifices to worship anymore, and yet the principle that there must be a sacrifice for us to approach God is still in force, isn't it? But the sacrifice by which we come to the Lord is the one that all the animal sacrifices were pointing to, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We bring that sacrifice, and we come in that name to worship the Lord, and we are received. The Lord has fulfilled the ceremonial system that was pointing to Him, and now we look to Him as our high priest, and we look to His sacrifice to come to the Lord but I want you to notice the principle of sacrifice and of mediator still holds. It's just changed into the hands of Christ because that's what it was pointing to. Now, you also don't have to keep the civil laws that God gave to Israel, those particular laws that he gave them to regulate their society because many of those apply to the specific situation that they were living in. Again, the classic example, do you have to put a fence around your roof? so that nobody falls off your roof. Well, no, you don't have to do that because we don't use our roofs the way they did. However, we do have to keep the moral principle that is behind those laws. Uh, the Lord gave that commandment to protect life. We still need to protect life. If we have, uh, well, a pool in our backyard, we need to protect you know, little kids from falling into it. If there's a pit in our backyard, we need to put a fence around it so nobody falls into it and dies. There's a principle that's involved there, and that principle continues. That's what Jesus is talking about here. This is what Westminster Assembly called the general equity of the law. That is still in force. So I believe what Jesus is saying here is that the morals, the moral principles, the ethics, the justice that is contained in the law and the prophets have not changed because they can't change, because they are the very definition of righteousness. That's what Jesus Christ came to fulfill, the law and the prophets. He, he was the one who satisfied every single law in, in, that, in, in the law and the prophets, even the least of them, so that the Lord, so that God the Father would be able to show you and me His grace. Jesus fulfilled the law so that he could give you a perfect righteousness if you're trusting in Jesus Christ. But don't forget that when Jesus Christ fulfilled that law, he also did it as an example to you and to me that we are to do exactly the same thing. We are to follow his example. He obeyed the law. That's what we are to do. So have the Ten Commandments been set aside? I don't think so. Now, let me just give you one, one further argument, and I think this, this is, again, absolutely conclusive. What the author to the Hebrews points out in Hebrews chapter 8, uh, verses 8 through 12. Now, I don't want to read that. I hope you're familiar enough with it. But basically, the author to the Hebrews points out the, what he considers to be the only difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And it's basically this, that in the Old Covenant, the law was written on tables of stone. And in the New Covenant, the law is written on the fleshly tablets of the heart. Now, while they were written only on stone, it didn't give the people who read the law the power to do the law, to keep it. 
And that's why the Lord says in verse 9, For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them. That's the reason why the Lord set that covenant aside. But then how did he fix the problem? Well, in the new covenant, he takes the law and he writes it upon our hearts. He gives us a love for the commandments so that we will keep them from our hearts. Now, we ask the question, what is the law that... that the author to the Hebrews, and he's really just quoting Jeremiah 31 and the promise of the new covenant. What is the law that is actually written on our hearts? Well, it's the same law that was written on the tablets of stone, the ones they didn't keep. And the reason why God put them away is because they didn't keep it. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about his judgment on Israel because they would not obey him. The law they would not obey, God writes on the tablets of the hearts of his people by his Holy Spirit so that they will keep it, so that God won't put us away and cast us away and won't care for us. This is the whole point of redemption, the whole point of why the Lord sent his son into the world to redeem us is so that we would keep these commandments. In the new covenant, God actually gives you the power to keep those commandments. He turns you from darkness to light, from unrighteousness to righteousness. So are the commandments relevant for us today? Are they still the standard? These are the very things that God writes on your heart, these very principles. He gives you a love for that standard and not for a different standard. It is the same standard as the commandments written on stone because God's moral principles never change. They are always the same. So again, the Lord has not abolished the law in the new covenant. He has given us the power to keep it so that we will reflect the image of our Lord Jesus Christ who also kept the law. Jesus is our example, and Jesus, by his work, gives us the power to follow that example. Now, finally, let's just simply consider what difference all this makes. Does it really make any difference? Well, I hope you see it makes a huge difference. Jesus already told us in our passage to annul Even the least commandment, and to teach others to do the same, reduces your standing to the very least in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that's a big difference to begin with, assuming that you're doing this ignorantly, I think, because if you did it on purpose, you knew God commanded, you know, that we should do this, but you don't do it, you teach others not to do it, that says, you know, something is wrong with your character. If you disregard any commandment, knowing that God commands you to do it, knowing that it continues, then you're sinning. And if you continue to sin without repenting, if you continue to sin without fighting against any sin, then you're practicing sin. And the Bible says if you practice sin, that you are not born of God. I mean, listen to what uh, John writes in 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. So if you do it willfully, if you say, I know God commands this, but I'm not going to do it and I I don't think you should do it either, you're, you're practicing sin. And this is the very thing John says is the evidence you don't even know God. But So breaking the commandments knowingly is devastating, but even breaking the commandments ignorantly can have heavy consequences. If you don't keep these commandments, you teach others, you'll be called least in the kingdom. Now he goes on to say something even more drastic than that. If you try to keep the commandments to save yourself, again, the thing we saw that Paul was condemning, as the scribes and the Pharisees were in fact trying to do, he says you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven at all. Your righteousness needs to be greater than the efforts of unconverted men, uh, the best efforts that they can possibly produce. You have to have a greater righteousness. Again, remember what Jesus says here in verse 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, is Jesus here talking about the You know, the righteousness that's imputed to us by the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, yes and no. We need that to enter into heaven, of course. But if you have it, your life is going to change, and you are going to live a life more righteous 
than the scribes and the Pharisees because their efforts, again, were the efforts of unconverted people who had altered the law to bring it down to their standard so that they could keep it in good conscience and not have a guilty conscience. Well, it has to be greater than that. And if you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you will have a righteousness, a personal righteousness that will be greater than that. Now again, realize that Jesus is not telling us here that you have to keep the law to be saved in the sense of, of earning your salvation, but he is saying that you must keep them as the evidence of a godly life. That submission to the Lord Jesus Christ, obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ has to be in your life. If you are a true believer, if you're going, as John MacArthur put it, if you're going to receive Jesus as Savior, you must also receive him as Lord. I mean, think about this. In the New Covenant, the Spirit of God writes the law on your heart so that you'll love it and you'll want to do it. If you're not obeying the law of God, if you're not submitting to Christ, what does that say about your heart? Well, it says the Spirit of God has not written that law on your heart because if he did, you would be keeping it. You must be growing into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ if you're saved. Something that the scribes and the Pharisees were not doing and knew nothing about. Jesus says you have to if you were to enter the kingdom of heaven at last. So again, are the commandments relevant? Yes, they are relevant. The Lord tells us they continue. The Lord tells us he writes them on our hearts. And if we are not obeying them, if we're not growing in righteousness, if we're not different than the scribes and the Pharisees, we're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven at all. Yes, they are relevant. So in closing, let's just think about this for a minute and use it to examine ourselves with regard to our conversion, with regard to whether or not we really are the Lord's. Is the evidence that Jesus is talking about here that the author to the Hebrews is talking about, that Jeremiah was saying is the character of the new covenant, that desire to walk in obedience to the Lord, the same thing that we see reflected in Psalm 119, right? That love for the law of God and that, that you know, considering it's so blessed to be able to keep them and to walk in them, is, is that your heart? You know, have you trusted Jesus Christ? Are you repenting from your sins? And are, are you obeying the Lord in this way? because this is what you want to do, because it's in your heart to do it, not because somebody's standing over you and saying, you've got to do it. You know, not because of peer pressure, not because of family pressure, not because of external forces, not because of what you know, the people here in this church might think of you, but are you doing it because it's in your heart to do it? Well, if, if that is the case with you, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. You are an heir of heaven, and you will enter into the kingdom of heaven at last. But if it isn't, then the law has not been written on your heart. You're still unconverted. You need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or, Jesus says, you will perish. So again, this is a way that we can know that we are born again, is that we love God's holy standard in the law. We can use the Ten Commandments because they're a summary of everything that God desires of us, everything he requires of us. Do you love that law? In the way, again, expressed by the psalmist. Uh, loving it, not just saying, hey, that's nice, I really like that, you know, but I'm going to do this. No, do you love it enough actually to do it? Is that your heart? You know, is, is Christ being formed in you uh, his meat and drink was to do the will of the Father more than his necessary food. Is, is that how you feel about it? Maybe not to the degree that Jesus did because he was anointed with the Spirit above measure, but is that desire in you? That's how we can know that we are the Lord's. If it isn't, well, may the Lord graciously grant that he would show you that that is the case with you, and may he grant to you his Spirit so that you can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, turn from your sins because you want to do that, and begin to follow the Lord Jesus from the heart to obey him that you might live. Well, may the Lord grant that mercy to all of us this evening.
Let's bow in a moment of prayer. Let's, let's ask the Lord to take this and apply it to our lives.